The Pentagon has served for more than 60 years as a symbol of power and freedom. A five-sided fortress where 23,000 people formed the nerve center of the nation's military. Then, on September 11, 2001, terrorists tested its strength. They turned a commercial jet into a weapon of destruction. The American people suffered enormous losses that day, but the building itself proved to be a shield. I told her, hold on to me. Don't let me go wherever I go. I got you. We're going to get out of here. No camera captured the horror of the attack, but computer graphics now illustrate the events at the Pentagon. Behind this terror are stories of heroic acts, bravery, and miraculous survival of those whose fate took only seconds to determine. The United States of America, Arlington, Virginia, the Pentagon, September 11, 2001, 6.46 a.m. While many Americans are asleep, the citadel of American defense kicks into action. This is the 11th of September. Good morning, I'm at your day. Army Lieutenant Colonel Marilyn Wills is already planning her day. That morning, I called a girlfriend and asked if she could get the girls to school because I had to go and my husband had to go. So I kissed them, smacked them, I'm out. Marilyn is one of almost 23,000 employees who converge on the Pentagon every working day. Men and women, civilians, soldiers and sailors, Marines and airmen. The Pentagon is one of the largest office buildings in the world. Its five floors are made up of a unique five-ring design. Almost 18 miles of corridors weave through more than six and a half million square feet of office space, the equivalent of three Empire State Buildings. It's a city unto itself, with all conveniences under one roof, and a high-tech operations center monitoring the building's safety and security. 7 a.m. Bobby Hogue, a top Marine Corps lawyer, arrives at the Pentagon. I had a standing breakfast meeting with the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. We met at the General Officer's Mess, you know, oh, dark 30, as the Marines say. The day also begins early for those catching West Coast flights out of Washington's Dulles International Airport. Seven eighteen a.m. Terrorists carrying knives and box cutters make it through the airport security checkpoint and board American Airlines Flight 77. 8 a.m. The Pentagon offices are now in full swing. Lieutenant Colonel Marilyn Wills has staff meetings every other Tuesday morning. A deputy chief of staff in the Army's personnel division, Wills has a particularly full agenda for the September 11th meeting. My office mate and I discuss what I'm going to talk about at the, the Tuesday meeting. And um, so I told her, see you later, and I went on to the conference room. 8.20 a.m. Air traffic controllers at Dulles Airport clear American Airlines Flight 77 for takeoff. Your departure frequency will be 125.05, runway 30, cleared for takeoff. 12505, runway 30, cleared for takeoff, American 77. On board are 53 passengers, two pilots, four flight attendants, and five men planning mass murder. Among the passengers are a family of four, a political commentator, and three students with their teachers on a trip led by two employees of the National Geographic Society. The aircraft's fuel tanks carry enough for its 2,300-mile cross-country flight to Los Angeles. 8.46 a.m. This just in, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed report that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. John Yates is a security manager at the Pentagon. So I stood there for about four or five minutes uh, watching and walked back to my desk, uh, called my wife. Before she ended up, she said, honey, do me a favor and work from, the, work from underneath your desk for the rest of the day. 
And so I laughed and I said, sure, I will. I said, I love you and I'll see you tonight. At this moment, no one is quite sure of the gravity of the situation. 8.50 a.m., 30 minutes into its journey, American Airlines Flight 77 is now at its cruising altitude of more than 34,000 feet and is crossing the Ohio-Kentucky border. The air traffic controller at the Indianapolis Control Center radios the pilot. American 77, clear direct comma. Uh, direct comma with American 77, thank you. These are the last words heard from the pilot. American 77, American Indy radio check, how do you read? American 77, American Indy radio check, how do you read? There's no answer. The air traffic controllers become concerned. This guy's never been able to raise him at all? No, no, uh, no radio communications and no radar. In the same instant, the plane's flight information disappears from the controller's radar screen. They no longer know where the plane is. 8.54 a.m. Without anyone realizing, American Airlines Flight 77 changes course. It turns around and heads back east. On the fourth floor of the Pentagon, Bobby Hogue, Peter Murphy, and another Marine Corps lawyer discuss a case. 9.03 a.m. A second plane hits the World Trade Center. Bobby Hogue is convinced this is a terrorist attack. So, everybody knows now what's happening. And, um, and you know, now you have to act. You have to do something. In offices throughout the Pentagon, tension mounts. Lieutenant Kevin Schaefer watches the breaking news on TV from his office on the first floor. I couldn't concentrate on my work, and I stood up at my desk, and I just remember just standing there and, and watching the events unfold. Some of my colleagues were uh, intending to call their wives or their spouses. And, you know, it was, it was an emotional moment where they wanted to reach out. The Pentagon is now a target as the national crisis comes closer to home. Firefighter Alan Wallace is one of a three-man crew based at the Pentagon's fire station. He's busy checking the Pentagon's fire truck. At noon today, President Bush is scheduled to arrive. 9.30 a.m. Al, this is Chief Campbell. Allen receives a call from his fire chief. The information that Campbell gave me is that the government is considering this a terrorist attack. There's no doubt about it. And something like this could very possibly happen in Washington, D.C. And if that did happen, then our fire trucker would be responding to that incident more than likely. Marilyn Wills is still in her meeting, isolated in the conference room on the second floor. She knows nothing about the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers. And I just happened to glance at my watch and said, boy, this, this meeting is going a little long. 9.32 a.m. American Airlines has grounded all planes nationwide. As Washington Dulles controllers clear the sky, they spot a fast-moving blip on their radar. It was an unidentified plane to the southwest of Dulles, moving at a very high rate of speed. I had literally a blip and nothing more. Traveling around 500 miles per hour, the plane is heading straight for the protected airspace covering the Capitol and the White House. And it was just a countdown, 10 miles west, nine miles west. And all of a sudden, the plane turned away. But the unidentified plane makes a dramatic 330 degree turn, nearly a complete circle. It's now heading directly for the Pentagon. We lost radar contact with that aircraft. And we waited, and we waited, and your heart's just beating out of your chest. Sekaster now continues. September 11, 2001. Two airliners fly into the Twin Towers in New York City. Nine thirty-two a.m. Another aircraft has dropped off the radar and is heading straight for the Pentagon. At nine thirty-seven, firefighter Alan Wallace is outside the Pentagon's west wall by his fire truck. 
We passed the right front corner of the fire truck and probably 15 feet further than that. And uh, I happened to look up and look to my left and there is an airplane. 938. The Boeing 757, now at 530 miles per hour, is one second from impact. It flies so low it knocks down three streetlights and crashes into the Pentagon's west side. A security camera captures the immediate aftermath. This is the only photographic evidence that exists of the impact. The plane tears through the west wall. Kevin Schaefer's office on the first floor takes a direct hit. I just remember a gigantic fireball, the space exploding um, and knocking me to the ground. I was on fire and uh, I knew I had to extinguish the flames, but it just happened so quickly uh, and truly, literally, the shock of the moment really uh, disoriented me. John Yates and Marilyn Wills are on the second floor, immediately above the impact zone. Everything I touched burned me. Everything was instantaneously hot, just like the inside of an oven. And I could feel water on my back from the sprinklers. Someone grabbed the, the back of my pants and I told her, hold on to me. Don't let me go wherever I go. I got you. We're going to get out of here. So we started to crawl. I was first and then the civilian was behind me. Not knowing there were several people behind her because you couldn't see anyone. If you put your hand in front of your face, you could not see your hand. It was that dark with smoke. And the lady behind me tugged on my pants and said she couldn't go any further because the smoke was just so intense. Um, and she's like, every time I breathe, it, it hurts. And, I, and so I had on my black army sweater and whatever was falling from the ceiling liquid, I was putting my sweater in it and sucking on it because my mouth just felt like it was on fire. And so I passed it to her and I said, just suck on this. And I said, don't swallow, just suck on and spit it out. Operators in the building's Defense Protection Service Communication Center receive frantic phone calls from trapped employees. They coordinate the rescue effort and stay at their desks even while the entire building is being evacuated. On the fourth floor, 24 feet above the plane's impact, Bobby Hogue is thrown across his office. Thick black smoke turns day into night. Bobby and four co-workers fight to breathe, desperately searching for a way out. But there's a problem with the escape route. To the south of us, the floor is obviously broken open and that doesn't look stable. And we were afraid and we were in a tight, a tight spot. Firefighter Wallace dives for cover and suffers only minor cuts and burns. The blast sets his fire truck ablaze, but without a moment's hesitation, he climbs into the burning vehicle to call for backup. Four minor rescue engines at 161 are responding. E for box 7560, reported an airliner into the Pentagon, heliport side. Thick black smoke is choking Kevin Schaefer. But as he crawls over piles of hot debris and intense fires, he spots a possible escape route. I could see the sunshine almost, but it was all obscured by the smoke. I really just started racing towards that light. And I walked um, through this hole, and it was obviously this freshly blown out hole. But up on the second floor, Marilyn Wills is still trapped. We just start banging on this window sill, just with feet and hands and the heel of our hands, and the window sill popped open. The lady who was behind me was a lot older than we were, so we knew she had to go first. And the soldier who was standing there had been burned severely, so we lowered him down. So at that point, it left uh, my boss and I in the window. And I knew my office mate was still in there because she didn't have a meeting. And I knew several other people had to be in that area. And so he told me it was my turn to go. And I told him I couldn't because I wanted to go back. He pretty much gave me an order and said, you go out of the window now. I think that was the hardest thing I had to do because I knew people were in there. But I knew it was suicidal if we went back. So I, I got out of the window. 9.45 a.m. 
10 fire trucks battle to gain control of the blazing inferno. Temporary triage units treat those victims that do escape. By the blazing west wall, Alan Wallace helps those trying to get out through the windows above. The building is on fire. These people coming out of the building are terrified. They're hurt and they're burned. They don't know where they are. The fire is coming out of the top half of the window and the smoke is blowing out of the bottom half and these people are trying to get out of the building. As the inferno rages, it's impossible for firefighters to reach those trapped on the fourth floor. Black smoke billows from both ends of the corridor. Bobby Hogue and his four co-workers keep searching for a way out and come across the crack in the floor again. Now it's opened up and it's dropped even further and you can see the fire coming up through the floor. They're trapped. The odds are against them. Follow my voice. Come, come this way. Some young guy saying, there's a way out here. There's a way out this way, this way. So we don't question much. We just kind of grab onto each other, hunch over and make for the door. 9.55 a.m. 17 minutes after the plane flew into the Pentagon, firefighters hear the building creaking and cracking. Huge slabs of the floor are sinking. It's about to collapse, so they rush to evacuate the area. 9.57 a.m. 19 minutes after impact, a 75-foot section of the building collapses. It's an agonizing 10 minutes before firefighters get the all clear to resume rescue efforts. Amazingly, Kevin Schaefer, Marilyn Wills, John Yates, and Bobby Hogue all manage to make it out in time. They are rushed into emergency helicopters and ambulances. 11.30. The fire is now so fierce that it takes firefighters almost 24 hours before they can extinguish the last of the flames. For the first time in American history, terrorists attack the premier defense headquarters of the most powerful nation in the world. Now, by looking back at the events of that day and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what happened. Cutting edge computer graphics will go where no camera can into the heart of the disaster zone. This terrorist act has claimed the lives of 184 innocent victims, 59 passengers and crew aboard the plane, and 125 Pentagon workers. Almost 23,000 people work in the Pentagon every day. When the plane crashes into the building at 530 miles per hour, it's loaded with nearly 5,300 gallons of jet fuel. It's an explosive force with the energy of over half a ton of TNT. Much more of the building should have been destroyed. If investigators can figure out how so much of the Pentagon survived, they can protect more people in offices across America and the world. The FBI takes over the crime scene, and the American Society of Civil Engineers gathers a team of six fire and structural experts to examine the building's damage. But investigators don't start with the building. First, they need to concentrate on the flight and examine how the plane entered the Pentagon. They begin by listening to air traffic flight recordings. 78 minutes before impact, American Airlines Flight 77 gets clearance for takeoff from Dulles International Airport. American 77, your departure frequency will be 125.05, runway 30, cleared for takeoff. 12505, runway 30, cleared for These recordings show American that for the first 31 minutes, American Airlines Flight 77 was flying on course and in communication with air traffic control. 44 minutes to impact. Data from the aircraft's black box proves that American Airlines Flight 77 begins a 180-degree turn and heads back east over West Virginia. 42 minutes before impact, all contact with the flight is lost. American 77, American Indy radio check on read. What was happening in that aircraft after the pilot's last communication with air traffic control? As a former air crash investigator with the National Transportation Safety Board, Bob Francis has a good idea. Clearly there was no problem at 8.50. 8.56, hijackers in control of the airplane. 
one of the very first things the hijackers would have done would have been to turn the transponder off. The transponder is a device that relays the aircraft's flight details, its number, speed, and altitude to air traffic control. With the transponder off, American Airlines Flight 77 is reduced to a small blip on the radar screen. They no longer knew which aircraft on their radar was American 77. They basically lost this airplane. This means that for 36 minutes, American Airlines Flight 77 is able to fly east towards Washington, D.C.'s protected airspace, undetected by air traffic controllers. Six minutes to impact. Suddenly, Washington air traffic controller Danielle O'Brien sees the fast-moving blip headed for the White House. But before she can react, it disappears. Four minutes to impact. The black box confirms that the plane has entered a dive, dropping 2,200 feet, turning 330 degrees to line up with the Pentagon. It increases its speed to 530 miles per hour. American Airlines Flight 77 penetrates the Pentagon's west wall. This computer recreation shows that the plane is flying dangerously low. Now the angle at which it hits the building becomes the new focus for investigators. It now continues. Five terrorists have hijacked an American Airlines jet and crashed it into the first floor of the Pentagon. Using advanced computer graphics, we can reveal the chain of events that led to this disaster. Discovering how the plane hits the building is a critical first step in investigating the tragedy. There are no images of the actual impact. The only photographic evidence is from a security camera. It takes one photo every second, but at 530 miles per hour, the plane hits the building between photos. The one shot that would help the investigators, the critical moment of impact, is missing. Lead structural engineer Alan Kilsheimer is one of the first experts on the scene. When I first got there, I had no idea how the plane hit the building. Alan focuses on the plane's entry point. You could see the marks on the limestone where the right wing had made a mark as it went in. So you knew it was banked with the right wing higher and the left wing lower. 938. The plane comes in at an angle. The right wing hits the sturdy cement and steel base of the first floor slab and breaks off. But what happens to the left wing? Investigators make another discovery. Just in front of the left side of the hole, they find pieces of an aircraft wing buried nearly two feet into the earth. Investigators now know exactly how the plane hit the Pentagon. The plane approaches the west wall diagonally, flying nearly level with the ground, until one-tenth of a second before impact, the plane rolls slightly to the left. At the moment of impact, the lower left wing and engine strike the ground at nearly the same instant that the nose hits the building. It's a critical piece of information because the angle at which it enters the building dictates the path the plane follows inside. There's a thin line between surviving or not, and it's a matter of inches. Now investigators need to know what happens as the plane travels through the building. For clues, they turn to dramatic footage of a controlled aircraft crash test. In 1984, the Federal Aviation Administration tested the effectiveness of a fire retardant fuel by crashing a Boeing 720 aircraft in the Mojave Desert. They match this experiment to what happens to Flight 77. First, they compare the speeds. The plane in the experiment was traveling at 170 miles per hour when it hit the tarmac. From its black box, 
investigators know that the hijacked 757 was flying three times that speed when it hit the Pentagon, 530 miles per hour. Then they compare the distances each plane traveled after crashing. The test crash Boeing 720 slid nearly 1,200 feet before it stopped. But the conditions of Flight 77 were not the same. It was traveling three times faster into a fortified building. Pentagon investigators find the furthest remnants of the plane only as far as 310 feet into the building. What investigators now want to know is exactly how did the building structure slow down the plane so much that it limited damage. Destruction to the first floor is all they have to go on. In a new age of terror, structural experts need to find out how to protect people in office buildings against a terrorist attack. The plane crashed into the Pentagon with such force it destroyed many of the supporting concrete columns, 65 feet in, 100 feet in. But then at almost 160 feet inside the building, columns are damaged but still standing. Investigators are able to build a clear picture of what went on inside the Pentagon. So what really happened was that the entire plane disintegrated as it went through the building. This is the moment of impact. The aircraft's nose acts like a tank round tearing an opening into the building's face. One hundredth of a second after impact, the plane hits the first eight columns and begins to break up. Two hundredths of a second, there's still momentum, and what's left of the plane continues traveling forward through offices. Half a second, the black box cockpit recorder and the landing gear punch nearly 300 feet into the building. These are the only recognizable parts of the plane to survive. The plane tears through the first floor offices, just below John Yates and his colleagues. But it is fire and toxic smoke that claims the lives of nearly two-thirds of the victims. Fire protection engineer Tom Stanton evaluated the performance of the building. What these forces did was push everything all around through the building into piles and they burned, taking out the walls, taking out the ceilings, everything and just pushing it everywhere. These piles are like massive bonfires. All they need now is fuel and ignition. At impact, the aircraft is carrying nearly 5,300 gallons of fuel. Some of the fuel feeds the huge 415-foot high fireball outside. But the rest comes into the building with the plane, moving almost 800 feet per second. It sprays jet fuel everywhere, including onto the piles of debris. John Yates is on the second floor. My glasses were still on my head, and when I took them off, I thought they were covered in blood because there was something on them, and I now know that it was jet fuel. Pentagon workers who survived the initial impact now face an unbearable set of circumstances. You swallow, you could feel your lungs expanding and shrinking, and you couldn't use your eyes because the smoke was so intense. Conditions are intolerable. Fires and explosions rage along the plane's 310-foot track through the building. As widespread as those fires were, some people, like John Yates, did survive. But how? Just one year before 9-11, the Pentagon's fire protection systems were overhauled. Engineers installed high-powered sprinklers that could handle twice the amount of fire. As luck would have it, these new sprinklers existed in the very part of the building the plane hit. John Yates, on the second floor, suffered second and third degree burns over 35% of his body. But without these extra sprinklers, he wouldn't have survived. Sprinklers are the most important thing when it comes to fire suppression or fire protection because they're automatic, they're very reliable, and they, they do the job and they do it well. But it was a different story on the first floor. Here, investigators were sure no one in the plane's path could have survived, but remarkably, one man did. How he got out alive is an incredible story. Seconds.
Fires rage in the west wing of the Pentagon after terrorists crash American Airlines Flight 77 into the first floor. Uh, there we were in the heart of the Pentagon, and uh, all of a sudden, in an instant, uh, everything is exploding around me. Dr. Georgine Glatz is chief engineer of the Pentagon renovation program. You see, all the damage, and you don't have a clue who behind those walls and desks survived. For answers, the Pentagon task force turns to those who did make it out alive. They plant their exact positions within the critical zone and listen to each gruesome story. Six weeks into the investigation, Dr. Glatz has interviewed 30 survivors. Then she hears of a man still recovering at Washington Hospital Burn Center. His name is Kevin Schaefer. Her interview with Kevin reveals something remarkable. Kevin's desk was in the direct path of the plane on the first floor. I just remember a gigantic fireball, the space exploding um, and knocking me to the ground. The forces of the plane moving at almost 800 feet per second drags fuel into the building, drenching stacks of debris which ignite. How did Kevin survive? I took off in another direction and just literally started crawling and, and climbing over debris and and through and around um, pockets of, of quite a bit of fire. As the plane comes into the building, it acts now like a big um, tank round. It's almost like if you're blowing up something in a rock quarry and you have milliseconds apart different, different explosions. That's what was happening. This film shows what happens during an explosion. The first stage is the bomb's lightning fast blast wave. As energy pushes out from the explosion, it compresses air particles in its path to create a shock wave. It travels faster than the speed of sound, demolishing everything in its path. Using advanced computer graphics, we see in those milliseconds after impact how the blast wave moves through the Pentagon's first floor. As the plane travels through the building, there are multiple explosions spaced milliseconds apart creating shock waves that follow a path of least resistance, bouncing off solid objects, moving in chaotic paths throughout the building. The ricocheting blast waves miss Kevin, but if he had been standing just inches to his left or right, he would have been hit squarely by the blast waves. Had I been knocked unconscious, I don't think I would have survived in that space. I mean, I clearly wouldn't have. The blast waves that miss Kevin blow a hole into a roadway. This provided his only means of escape. Kevin got out by crawling another 88 feet. He suffered burns over 42% of his body and had two cardiac arrests while in the hospital. How the blast waves that missed Kevin behaved has to do with the Pentagon's unique design. The Pentagon consists of five rings. The roadway that separates B and C rings is called A&E Drive. The shock waves raging through the first floor are enclosed within three rings of offices. There was no way for the pressure from all these explosions to relieve itself. And the first time it could relieve itself is when it hit A&E Drive. In the end, the path of destruction is only a small sliver of the entire six and a half million square feet of offices. If there had been no road between the rings, the blast forces would have continued wreaking havoc through at least one more solid ring of offices, killing more people on its way. But other features of the building also saved lives. To see them, we need to look back to the moments after impact. Marilyn Wills and those in the human chain crawl across the second floor to escape. They're directly above the crash zone. Concrete columns are blown apart and obliterated. But remarkably, the second floor remains standing for 19 minutes before it finally collapses. 
In these precious moments, Marilyn and her fellow survivors reach the window. The whole investigation now focuses on understanding why this part of the building withstood a jet going at 530 miles per hour and why it didn't collapse upon impact. As investigators map the area, they find that 30 of the first floor columns were destroyed and another 20 severely damaged. Structural engineers are mystified. With so many columns knocked out or damaged, what held up the building? They look back to 1941. Construction on the Pentagon began on September 11th, remarkably exactly 60 years before the terrorist attack. At the time, War Department officials believed there would be no need for such a massive war headquarters after World War II. The building would become a warehouse for files. To support the heavy loads, construction workers put in extra beams and columns, and they added extra steel reinforcements. After 9-11, the Pentagon's lead reconstruction engineer, Alan Kilsheimer, built an exact replica of the 1941 beam and column system found inside the Pentagon. If you blew this column out right here, what would happen is this beam would say, there's nothing holding me up anymore. And it would say, geez, I better go along this steel line over to the next column and see if I can carry myself to the next column. The fact that these bars were doubled up like this, either in the bottom or the top, allowed that to happen. Kilsheimer took a closer look. Each column contained a continuous piece of reinforced steel from floor to ceiling. What this does is this stops these bars from bending outward and it stops the concrete from in here from coming out of this cage. As the catastrophic forces raged through the first floor of the Pentagon, they destroyed 50 columns along the path of destruction. But it's the reinforced steel within the remaining columns that kept the building up. This wouldn't happen in today's construction. What happens is if one of these breaks, the whole thing doesn't fail, while in a new building, if one or two of those break, the whole column could blow out. But investigators discovered another feature of the 1941 design that also saved lives. Three minutes after the explosion, Bobby Hogue and his colleagues on the fourth floor came across a crack in the floor. Then I stepped over what was the expansion joint that bisected our office. And that's when I really became aware that the building was in a state of collapse, about to collapse, because it was clearly broken open. The floor had just cracked in half. The reason? The Pentagon's original designers added structural features called expansion joints. These joints accommodate the expansion and contraction of the building through the seasons. They allow room to expand in the heat of summer and contract in the cold of winter. Because of these expansion joints, the Pentagon behaves like a series of separate buildings. So on September 11th, the expansion joint on the Pentagon's west side protected the rest of the building and ultimately saved lives. 19 minutes after impact. It looks like a knife cut through the building right at the expansion joint. Had this not been an expansion joint and this would have been rigidly connected from this side to this side, we would have lost a much larger piece of the existing building uh, north of the expansion joint. The expansion joint bought time for the survivors to make their way to safety. If you're going to have to go through something awful like this, you know, the Pentagon is as good a place to choose as any. On 9-11, the Pentagon heroically withstood the extreme forces on its structure. But investigators found yet another reason why so many people survived. These windows. Mr. now continues. Investigators are uncovering the secrets of how the Pentagon withstood the 9-11 attack and how so many people survived. When the plane hit the Pentagon's west side, Bobby Hogue looked out the window and saw fire engulf the building. But that fire never touched him. Why? The answer was right in front of him. 
in the window. If someone had come to me in 2000 and said, we need to put a bomb-proof window in your office, I'd say, get out of here. What are we going to do with a bomb-proof window, you know? Well, guess what? Yeah, sure came in handy. In 1995, 168 people died in the Oklahoma City bombing. This and other acts of terror on office buildings taught building experts vital lessons. Engineers came up with improvements, including tougher windows. So where there were blast-resistant windows, people were able to escape, especially on upper floors. These windows, just feet from the plane's entry point, are still intact. Without them, Bobby and hundreds more Pentagon workers could have died. By 9-11, the Pentagon had installed these life-saving features into an area of the building known as Wedge One. When the terrorists lock onto their target on the morning of September 11th, it is this renovated section that appears in their sights. But the Pentagon renovation program also saved lives in ways no one could have predicted. On 9-11, the plane enters the building diagonally into Wedge One, but continues wreaking havoc into another section known as Wedge Two. Normally, 5,000 people work in this space, but by September 11th, renovation of this second wedge was underway. A few weeks earlier, most of the 5,000 employees who work in Wedge 2 were relocated to temporary offices elsewhere. Had this been in another area of the building, there could have been uh, tremendously higher, 10 times the amount of, of losses, much more on the ag magnitude of, uh, of New York City. Finally, investigators piece together the tragic course of events. 8.20, American Airlines Flight 77 takes off from Washington's Dulles Airport with 53 passengers and six crew aboard. 8.56, hijackers turn off the aircraft's transponder. Air traffic control loses Flight 77. 9.38, the Boeing 757 flies into the first floor of the Pentagon. In milliseconds, the aircraft begins to disintegrate. Fuel spews through the building. Violent fires and explosions track the plane's brief but deadly journey. 939, the sturdy 1941 construction, expansion joints, and blast-proof windows withstand the impact, allowing many Pentagon workers to make their way to safety. 957, only one-fifth of the area hit collapses. All the passengers and crew and 125 Pentagon workers perish. The heroism of the Pentagon employees themselves saved countless lives. Any service member, a soldier, airman, marine, it's something in you that you never leave your comrades. When that lady grabbed the back of my pants, I believe that was the best thing that happened to me that day. I was no longer responsible for Marilyn Wills. I was responsible for her and all of those people who followed her. A memorial inside the Pentagon is etched with the names of all those who lost their lives in the disaster. All military personnel wounded that day were awarded the prestigious Purple Heart. The disaster of 9-11 has changed the way we think, travel, and the way we design buildings. From ruin and heroism on 9-11, Construction crews in only one year rebuilt the damaged area on the Pentagon's west side. It was a huge pride thing and still is to this day for everybody. That building is such a symbol of, of America's strength and um, we've, uh, we've healed that building. The new walls restore the imposing appearance of the five-sided fortress. The Pentagon not only protects the United States in times of danger, the building itself provided the ultimate protection for thousands of Pentagon workers during a day of terror. But one scar in the facade remains. 
a block of Indiana limestone, still blackened by the fire from the attack, with a simple inscription. Its dark face is a dramatic contrast to the bright new limestone, but it is a chilling reminder of the events of that tragic day.